So people assume uh, we are just going back uh, to the good old world which we had um, and everything will be normal again in how we are used to normal in the old fashion. This is, uh, let's say, fiction. It will not happen. Um, the the uh, cut which we have now um, is much too strong uh, in order not to leave traces. We're now in the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution, which is bringing together digital, physical, and biological systems. One of the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. Aujourd'hui, au bout de ça, on parle de puces qu'on pourra s'implanter. Ce sera quand ça Certainement dans les dix années à venir. Et d'abord, on va les implanter dans nos vêtements, uh -huh. c'est-à-dire wearables, comme on le dit. Et après, on pourrait s'imaginer qu'on les implante dans nos cerveaux ou dans nos topos. Et à la fin, peut-être il y a une communication directe entre notre cerveau et euh, la, le monde digital. Ce que nous voyons, c'est une sorte de fusion du monde physique, digital et biologique. The difference of this first uh, industrial revolution is it doesn't change what you are doing. It changes you if you take a genetic editing. It changes you if you take a genetic editing. Our bodies will be so high tech, we won't be able to really distinguish between what's natural and what's artificial. The very idea of human being some sort of natural concept is really going to change. The Internet of Bodies, or IOB, is, um, is actually an ecosystem. It's a bunch of devices that are connected to the Internet that contain software and that either collect personal health data about you or can alter the body's function. Can alter the body's function. We think of the Internet of Bodies as this collection of all these devices as well as all the data that the devices are gathering about you. There are pills now that have an electronic sensor that let a healthcare provider know whether you have taken the medication. There's the cyber risk of, of, a, you know, of an actor potentially um, hacking into the system. You put it underneath your skin, and what that tells you is that there are chemical reactions going on inside the body, and that signal means you're going to have symptoms tomorrow. Wow. There's an actual transmitter in that? Yeah, it's like a check engine light. They created her to promote human to machine empathy and compassion. She's appeared on late night shows and the cover of fashion magazines. Sophia was even given legal citizenship in Saudi Arabia and appointed the UN's first non-human innovation champion. Her new role is in the healthcare sector, taking temperatures with a thermal camera on her chest or leading morning exercise with the elderly. Social robots like me can help take care of the sick or elderly in many kinds of healthcare and medical uses. I can help communicate, give therapy, and provide social stimulation even in difficult situations. In Sweden, the microchips are already here. The microchip implants use the same technology that's in contactless credit cards. Which have made cash pretty much obsolete in Sweden. No cash. At this tech fair, a chipping event for those on the cutting edge, merging their hands with this new technology. I thought it would be fun, right? Central banks have, like the Bank of England, already prepared their microchip implant, RFID chip, to be implanted under your skin. Um, and why is the sudden discussion about universal basic income from all the grassroots and inverted commas movements and billionaires. Oh, universal basic income is the bribe for you to accept the microchip. We're still essentially the banging the rocks together stage for this sort of stuff. And you haven't really seen anything yet. So this is closer to the end of the vision. This is this powder sized chip, um, and that's a salt crystal. So this is a small thing. It's something called the Mu chip from Hitachi. It's the smallest commercially available RFID system in the world and can be pulse powered by radio waves. It doesn't require a battery. You can literally scatter this stuff like dust or embed it into a sheet of paper. And you know what the really interesting thing about this technology is? This was commercially released 10 years ago. So the inevitability of smart dust. So what is smart dust? Well, 
Smart Dust, of course, isn't a new concept. It's the originated with DARPA back in the 90s. And it's general purpose computing, sensors, wireless network, networking, all bundled up into millimeter scale sensor modes, drifting in the air currents, flex of computing power settling on your skin, ingested, monitoring you inside and out. You're a neuroscience company, and you're working to build basically an interface to the brain. Yeah. Electrode to neuron interface at a mic micro level. Okay, what is it? Like, I'm gonna have like a plug in my head that's gonna fit into mm -hmm. a hard drive? Like, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, Ch a chip and a bunch of tiny wires. This, this would be implanted surgically. And it would do what? Could you input? Could you download Jim? Mm-hmm, yes. What, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> the long-term aspiration for Neuralink was, would be to achieve a symbiosis with uh, artificial intelligence. This project started because the government was interested in developing better ways for us to connect to the brain. What are the physical processes we could use? What are the techniques we, that might give us the ability to communicate with the brain through the skull? So we started this in, in a very exploratory phase, and we looked at how we might be able to use magnetic fields and how we might be able to use light. Both of these things can penetrate the skull, and we wanted to understand if signals from the magnetic field and from light would allow us to record and stimulate the brain. As the magnet turns on, the flies are stimulated, so we're working to stimulate their brain uh, using nanoparticles that I've already injected into the flies. By using nanoparticles that I've already injected into the flies. So if we attach a specific drug to the nanoparticles here, mm -hmm. um, we could put it in the entire body. What we've designed, and we've done this very, very quietly, but um, we're glad to now release it to the world, is this idea of teslapheresis, which is a discovery we made several years ago, and we've been developing it. And teslapheresis is the simplest way to understand it is self-assembly at a distance, just long distance assembly of, of materials. And what we did was, uh, because we're at Rice, we had plenty of nanotubes around, so we uh, decided to use nanotubes. And what we discovered was that these nanotubes can actually string together and form wires by themselves under this electric field. You can convert the carbohydrates that are within bread to graphene or we can do it on a coconut. So you can take a coconut and convert that into graphene. Now why would we want to have something like this? This is all conductive, and so it can conduct electricity. So what we can do now is we can make electronics embedded within fabrics and make electronics embedded within wood. Why would one want edible electronics? Well, first of all, let me start with, very often we don't see the advantage of something early on but when we make it available, people start seeing the real advantage. So can you even take, have electronics embedded on food and then say use this as a heat circuit to heat the food more easily? If there's say an RFID tag written onto this potato, where has it been, how long has it been stored, where did, where, what, what's its country of origin and its city of origin, and what path did it go to to get to your table? All that can be embedded, not on a separate tag that's placed on the food, but directly on the food itself. And these can also have sensors. I'm not comfortable with my body, so I want to get rid of it. This thing, all the arms and legs and every single bit of it, I don't want to be flesh. I'm really sorry, but I'm going to escape this thing and become digital. What do you mean? They say one day soon they'll have clinics in Switzerland where you can go and you'll sign a form and they'll take your brain and download it into the cloud. And your body? Recycled into the earth. So you want to kill yourself? I want to live forever as information because that's what trans humans are, Mum. Not male or female, better. Where I'm going, there's no life or death, there's only data. I will be data.
Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18 about this mark of the beast. It's the only time that the Bible really refers to it. And the word mark there in, in, the, in the Greek language means it like a tattoo, really, or an, or an etching or something that's scratched into something. So it says it's going to be upon the right hand or the forehead. And it says you can't buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the beast.